friends and others who are here for the memorial service for our dear friend Ararat Tumanian. We will open our service here with a word of prayer. Almost gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, how we just want to thank you for your love and your kindness. Lord, how we just thank you for breaking through the, the trouble and the curse in this world, Lord, to bring us your grace, your righteousness, Lord God. And Lord, we just want to thank you for Ararat, the way that, Lord, he was a, a blessing to this ministry. We thank you for his love, Lord, his care, his gentleness, his faithfulness, Lord God. And as we reflect upon his life, Lord, we just pray that our hearts will be touched and, Lord, that we will just consider your goodness, Lord God, that you express to us through him, through his ministry, Lord God, through his service unto you. And so, Lord, as we dedicate this time now unto you, and Lord, as we just re reflect upon Ararat's life, we just ask, Lord God, for your, your blessing, Lord, for your grace to shower this uh, service at this time. And Lord, we just uh, commit this hour now unto thee. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. The scripture I was asked to read today was from Psalm 23. And it from the King James Version. It says, The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thy rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest a table before me in the presence of mine enemies. Thou anointest my head with oil. My cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Amen. We will now hear the obituary reading from Edna Tarios. Good morning. Good morning. Today I stand in front of you with a heavy heart. This heaviness is felt also by brothers sisters, friends, and most of all, uncle to some in attendance. We are all here to celebrate the life of one incredible man with a full of heart and love. A man who was happy with the little things in life, the simple things, and I admired that so much about him. I also enjoyed watching movies with him and having lengthy conversations about the American and Armenian history. I enjoyed learning so much from him. I will miss our conversations. He was a quiet man with hidden talents, but his best and apparent talent was his ability to bring out the best in every person that he came across. He was full of love, humble, caring, and always a friend. It's very apparent that he made many friends at this church. Looking through pictures, hearing stories, the lives he touched is a testament of his character. He was a faithful man who loved the Lord, his family, church, and a community. Every one of you played a special role in his life. He was the first person to greet you at the office and probably the first person you saw walking in for Sunday service. He spoke highly about this congregation, spoke about the great work you all do, 
spreading kindness through the love of God. I would like to ask everyone here to take a minute to reflect on all the happy and joyful moments, the love, the laughter, and hold those moments, memories in your hearts and mind. Today we gather to celebrate you, Arat, to remember you, not just in our minds, but our hearts forever. We love you very much. I am confident that Arat is now with our creator. Thank you, Lord. You have gained a true angel. On behalf of the entire Tumania family and myself, I would like to extend a special thank you to Miss Ruby, who never left our uncle's side while he was in the hospital. We can't thank you enough for everything you have done. We would also like to thank you all for being here, for all your thoughts, prayers, and kindness you have shown our uncle and brother. It's a real comfort to know Arat was loved by so many and had a place in each of your hearts. We are very grateful for that. In loving memory of Ara Tumanyan, the surviving family invites you to celebrate his life after the service in the dining room. Thank you all for your time. I had one person in our ministry to uh, take us up on our offer to uh, provide a reflection on the life of Ararat, one who knew him for a number of years now, and that's uh, Moses Flores, and so he's going to come and share a few remarks at this time. Good morning. Good morning. Um, there's so many words to be able to describe this man. I just... Uh, had, it was a privilege and an honor um, when I first met him. He had encouraged me to join the witnessing team. And it's funny because the scripture that we read, Psalms 23, he um, encouraged me and my daughter to study it when he was able to meet my daughter. But uh, there was a story they were, they were telling me when we went, um, we used to go witnessing and we went to North Hollywood to a convalescent home. We went uh, every week. And we went to a, like a little ball that they had. And it was funny because the ladies were trying to get him to dance and everything, but he was trying to move away from them. But it, it was just a good experience just going out with him to all the churches. Um, it was a privilege. Like uh, the lady had shared earlier, you know, a, a man of God, um, just pushing everybody, not really pushing, but just encouraging everybody to find a, a relationship with the Lord. That's what he always encouraged all of us here you know, studying with him and just being able to spend time and getting to know him. It was just a true, true blessing, and I'm um, going to be missed. I'm thankful that I had the opportunity to meet him, and um, just thank you guys. Just have a great one. Yeah, thank you, Mo. Ararat uh, first came to our ministry back in 2006, and uh, when we first met him, of course, that name, we consider the mountains of Ararat, where uh, Noah's Ark came to rest and overlooks the land of Armenia, and so Ararat, it was rather fascinating, at least I thought anyway, to know that he came from Iran. When he uh, first entered the country here, it was my understanding that he spent several years in Chicago as Dr. Erwin Lutzer, who was pastor of Moody Church in the Windy City, would say, welcome to Chicago, the city of the quick or the dead. <laughs> then he came to Los Angeles, the city where you slowly die while waiting in traffic, <laughs> especially on the 405 where... Ararat spent a lot of time on Uber making his way up to all of you hospital for his chemotherapy treatments, 405 otherwise known as uh, the four or five mile per hour trek. But when he came to the BT, um, 
Ararat uh, checked in at our men's ranch in Canyon Country. Like everyone else, he started out on the grounds crew and then eventually he made his way uh, into the house crew and he was helping with custodial duties there and a variety of other tasks. And then uh, eventually he was part of the office staff uh, helping to perform intakes. And basically he had his own office because we had a shed next to our business office up at the ranch. And Ararat kind of claimed that as his own because we would have him go in with the new guys that entered and he would conduct the intakes. That also served as our library. We had some books and whatnot in there. But in the evenings, uh, Ararat would also monitor that room. Uh, guys had a laptop that they could use for emails and things like that. And uh, I think at one point there was even a phone that was hooked up in there. And so... Uh, Ararat would look that over, but the guys who were checking in, he had the responsibility of going through their things, make sure they weren't bringing in any drugs or sneaking in a fifth of whiskey or anything like that. So uh, he did, uh, did a rather good job taking care of things. He belonged to the witnessing team, and uh, he would join them on their regular evangelistic outreach trips to, uh, to the beach. He visited other churches with our men. Um, whenever I made a presentation at one of our supporting churches, Ararat was always there. And uh, I could always count on him to, uh, to be present. And he would sit there with people when we would have meals together. He'd be chatting with them, sharing with them about our ministry, his own testimony. He also visited convalescent homes and uh, hospitals. Uh, he attended many uh, conferences, missionary conferences, and other places that we went to at other churches. During our Thanksgiving and Christmas Day dinners, uh, Ararat would set up a table outside here in the back, and he would have the Bibles and the gospel tracts and the other pamphlets and literature, and he would pass those things out. And he was always there to speak and to share with people uh, about the, the gospel of our, our Lord Jesus Christ. And then for me, on a very personal level, uh, Ararat uh, attended to my mother. She spent the last three years of her life um, at a nursing care facility in Granada Hills. And Ararat was there virtually every day. And uh, he was sitting with her, uh, speaking with her, uh, catching her up on the latest news with our ministry, uh, having the time to pray with her. He would push her around in the wheelchair around the home, um, spend time reading God's word. And I always remember him saying with a, a chuckle that as he was reading, my mother was blind, by the way, uh, towards the end. And so even as he was reading scripture passages to her, if he missed something or got something wrong or whatever, she was quick to correct him because uh, she knew. So even though she couldn't see it, um, she knew what was, what was off. And uh, so he actually took great delight in that. But he was a man whose life was marked by faithfulness. And he spent the remaining years here in our ministry in Venice as he transferred from Canyon Country uh, he was working in the office, uh, taking phone calls, conducting intakes. Um, Ararat would uh, offer referrals and arrange for donation pickups. And he would offer words of comfort to people that were in distress. So he really did uh, quite a, a wonderful job uh, being there day in and day out. And even now we still have callers asking for Ararat. This just happened the other day. Where's Ararat? And uh, Michael Hughes was there. He took the call and explained that uh, he's now home with the Lord. Uh, he's uh, moved in with Jesus, so to speak. He's been reassigned, and he's now working up in heaven. So I love being able to say about a friend who knew the Lord that he is in heaven. And certainly Ararat is there living uh, where we as saints are waiting to go. 
And that's what it's all about. And we can say for certain that Ararat is there because he knew the Lord. He came to know Christ Jesus as his Lord and Savior here in the ministry. And we have that assurance in Scripture from the Apostle Paul of where we go at the moment that we die. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I'm going to begin with the first verse where Paul says, For we know that if our earthly house, this tent, this body that we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, one that is eternal in the heavens. For in this we groan, and the older we get, the more we groan. We're earnestly desiring to be clothed with our habitation, which is from heaven. To replace these earthly garments with heavenly ones. If indeed having been clothed we shall not be found naked. Because we will be clothed with immortality. For we who are in this tent being burdened. Not because we want to be unclothed. But further clothed. That mortality may be swallowed up by life. I love that expression that Paul uses in scripture. That the, this temporary dwelling that we are in now will just be consumed and overwhelmed by life that the Lord has for us. Now he who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who also has given us the Spirit as a guarantee. And that's a very significant point that we find in Scripture. When we come to know Christ Jesus as our Lord and Savior, the Holy Spirit is placed within us, and he serves as the guarantee of life everlasting. We see this in verse 21. In fact, I'm going to read verse 20 of 2 Corinthians 1, where Paul writes, For all the promises of God in him are yes, and in him amen, to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and has anointed us is God, who also has sealed us and given us the Spirit in our hearts as a guarantee. A guarantee of what? Heaven. A guarantee of eternal life with him. So we are always confident knowing that while we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. That's the condition in which we live right now. We are confident, yes, well pleased, rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. And that was certainly the Apostle Paul's desire. In fact, he expresses this in Philippians, in Philippians chapter 1, where... He says, for to me, in verse 21, for to me, to live is Christ, and to die is gain. But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. So Paul knew that he had a duty, a responsibility to the saints at the church in Philippi, even though he had a longing to go home to be with the Lord. For I am hard pressed, he says in verse 23, between the two, having a desire to depart and be with Christ, which is far better. Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And so he knew that God had an assignment for him here right now, but Paul was ready to go home and be with the Lord. He had that longing in his heart. And so Paul makes it clear here that when we are absent from the body, in 2 Corinthians 5.8, we are then present with the Lord. That's just a, a wonderful thought. This is an expression that goes all the way back to Old Testament times where we find in Job, in the midst of all of his travail, his agony, his pain, his loss, the loss of his family in particular, and everything that he was going through. In Job 19 and verse 23, he said, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. He got his wish. They were. They were engraved on a rock. That they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives. And he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Whom I shall see for myself and my eyes shall behold and not another. How my heart yearns within me. And that certainly was a declaration, a claim that Ararat himself was able to make. I know that my Redeemer lives. And Ararat had that contentment in his heart. He was ready to go home and to be with the Lord. And we have that wonderful assurance 
that comes to us from the Lord Jesus himself when he was speaking to Martha. Her brother had died an untimely death in John chapter 11. And in fact, Jesus had deliberately waited four days for him to die because he had something in mind. But here the Lord wanting to demonstrate his power over over death delayed his arrival in the town of Bethany. And yet Martha was overcome with sorrow at the loss of her brother. And she said in John eleven twenty one, 21, Lord, if you had been here, my brother would not have died. But even now I know that whatever you ask of God, God will give you. The Lord assured her, your brother will rise again. Of course, Martha was thinking in the future. I know that he will rise again in the resurrection at the last day. And certainly that is the prophecy that we find from Daniel in Daniel chapter 12 where he writes in verse 2, And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. And so this was the assurance that Jesus had given to Martha and yet he offered these words of comfort in John eleven twenty five. 25. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he may die, he shall live. And whoever lives and believes in me shall never die. Shall never die. And this is the absolute assurance that Ararat had. And we find further this fact that is taught in scripture that upon death we are transferred from this world right on into the next. In fact, when our Lord was dying on the cross, there were two criminals, two thieves that were crucified with him. And one of them coming to the realization that he was under not only the condemnation of the Roman Empire, which had led to his crucifixion, but also that of God because of the wickedness in his heart. And he says to his colleague in Luke 23, verse 40, Do you not even fear God, seeing you are under the same condemnation? We indeed justly, we're, we're getting what we deserve, for we receive the due reward of our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And realizing who Jesus was and seeking for mercy, he says to him in verse 42, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus said to him, truly, truly, assuredly, I say to you, today you will be with me in paradise. Today you will be with me in paradise. I can tell you that Ararat, upon his departure, immediately entered the presence of our Lord. In the parable that the Lord Jesus taught in Luke chapter 16, he spoke of a certain rich man and a beggar by the name of Lazarus. The rich man's name is not given although there may be something in the name of rich man there that indicated who he might have been. Here was a man of prominence, a man who was well known. Lazarus was just a nobody. He laid at his gate desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table, just a few leftovers. Perhaps the only comfort he received was from dogs who came and licked his sores. But we read in verse 22 of Luke 16, so it was that the beggar died, And what happened to him? At the moment of his death, he was carried by the angels to Abraham's bosom. The rich man also died and was buried. But here we read that the beggar was taken immediately into the presence of God. He was there to see Abraham, who is the father of the Jewish people. And it was angels who carried him, angels who escorted him into paradise, into that heavenly kingdom. It happened right then and there. And so we're given insight in scripture as to what happens with our souls upon death. And therefore we can be prepared. 
We can be ready. And we know that now is the time for that preparation because we read in Hebrews 9.27, it's appointed unto man what's to die. After this, the judgment. But through faith in Christ, we are united with God. We are at peace with him. In fact, Paul writes in Romans 5.1, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we are justified, which means that we are made right. We are declared righteous by God, which is what the term justify means. We're justified by faith. We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. We have peace with God. The Apostle John wrote, he that has the Son has life. He that does, does not have the Son of God does not have life. And then another passage in Romans 8.1, Paul also wrote there, there is therefore now, and I trust that you'll highlight the word now, there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. There is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Ararat was in Christ Jesus, as is every saint. Saints are holy ones, those who are set apart unto God. You become a saint at the moment you trust in Christ as your Lord and Savior. Not something which occurs later, you have that assurance now. And Paul, in Ephesians chapter 2, writes of salvation, saying, But God, in verse 4, who is rich in mercy... Because of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead in trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved, and raised us up together, and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. This is written as though these things have already been accomplished, as though they have happened. We have been raised together, we have been made to sit together, we have a place in heaven with him. We are assured of that, we are guaranteed that in the ages to come he might show the exceeding riches of his grace and his kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. For by grace you have been saved through faith, that not of yourselves it is the gift of God. It's not of works. Salvation is the gift of God. But the only way that we can enter into God's presence is to be as holy as he is. God is holy, God is perfect, God is pure, he's separated from sin, he cannot tolerate any sin at all, he can't just up and willy-nilly forgive us and overlook our sin, it doesn't work that way. God's holiness demands justice. And we're in trouble because nobody is perfect. The scripture says, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And this is why God sent his son, the Lord Jesus Christ. God became man. He lived the perfect life from the time he was born until the time that he died. He's the only perfect human being who fulfilled the righteousness of God. And thus he became the perfect sacrifice for us by dying on the cross. He was able to take our sin upon himself and pay that penalty. And so he died paying the penalty for my sin. And his death is what provided for our forgiveness, furnishes our forgiveness, and his resurrection is what secured everlasting life for us. And so when we trust in Christ as our Lord and Savior, he takes that sin and he forgives it. It's like a debt. We could say that the bank just forgives a $10 million debt, but they don't stop there. They actually put $10 million in our account. And so in God's mercy, he forgives all of that. And by his grace, he places upon us the righteousness of his son. That is what we receive. That is the ticket by which we are able to enter God's presence because that is what God the Father acknowledges is the righteousness of the Lord Jesus Christ. That is how we qualify. And it's all because of him. And this is why it's by grace we're saved. It's not... Of works. I want to read Ephesians 1.13 where Paul writes here, In him, that is in Christ Jesus, you also trusted. After you heard the word of truth, the gospel, the gospel means good news, 
of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you're then sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. There's that seal again. God's official seal, his stamp upon our heart, which serves as the guarantee of our inheritance, a guarantee of everlasting life until the redemption of the purchased possession. We become the purchased possession, having been purchased by the blood of Christ, that sacrifice of his son, the one whom John the Baptist said, Behold the Lamb of God, which takes away the sin of the world. And those Old Testament sacrifices that were required, the lamb was to be without blemish, without spot. It had to be perfect in every respect. And that was representative of the Lord Jesus Christ who became the ultimate sacrifice on our behalf. And so we're that purchased possession to the praise of his glory. There's nothing that we can do. Isaiah wrote that all of our righteousnesses are as filthy rags. So give it up. Don't try. That's not the issue. God took care of everything. We just come to him in simple faith. And if our attitude, our heart is like the publican and the Pharisee that the Lord Jesus speaks of in Luke chapter 18, who had gone to the temple to pray, The Pharisee was a righteous man. I mean, he was a very religious man. He just did everything that you were supposed to do. He was an upstanding citizen. And he was just gloating, boasting about his his, uh, accomplishments, all of his religious and righteous achievements. And I thank you, God, I'm not like this and I'm not like that. I don't have any wickedness. I'm not... Do everything that I'm supposed to do. And he had all of his religious ducks in a row. And he said, I'm not even like this publican, this tax collector, this traitor who collects taxes for the hated Romans. I mean, I shouldn't even be breathing the same air air with this guy. I shouldn't even be sharing space with him. But the publican who was standing far off, he wouldn't even look up to heaven. It was customary for Jews back then to hold their arms outstretched and to look up into heaven when they prayed. This man couldn't even do that. He just looked down, smacked himself on the chest, said, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus said, I tell you, this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. He's the man who received mercy. He's the man who received justification. And that is what God requires. That if you will confess with your mouth Jesus as Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. For with the heart man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Paul's Epitaph in 2 Timothy 4 would apply to Ararat. In verse 6, he wrote, For I am already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. Finally there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. No doubt, no questioning, no wondering what was going to happen. Paul was ready to go. And so was Ararat. And I want to close with these words that are given to us by Paul in 1 Thessalonians 4, beginning with the 13th verse. But I do not want you to be ignorant, brethren, concerning those who have fallen asleep, lest you sorrow as others who have no hope, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, 
with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first, then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. Therefore, comfort one another with these words. And with that, we're going to listen to one last scripture reading from Ararat, who did this faithfully every Sunday at our church. Today's scripture reading comes from the book of Philippians, chapter 3, verses 13 through 15. Philippians, chapter 3, 13 through 15. This is the word of God. Verse 13. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, Forgetting those, those things which are behind and reaching forth those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Let us therefore, as many as perfect, be thus minded. And if in any things ye be otherwise minded, God shall reveal even in these things unto you. May the God of peace bless his word and bless you who read his word, hear his word, and most importantly, walk according to his holy commandments. May the people of God say, Amen. Amen. God bless you. You may be seated. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, how we just thank you so much for the time that you allowed Ararat to grace us with his presence. Lord, we just want to thank you, Lord, for his contribution to not our ministry, Lord God, but not just our ministry, but your kingdom. And Lord, he has concluded his work. You gave him his assignment, and now, Lord, you called him home. And Lord, he is where we're going to be, and Lord, this is why we were created for eternity. This world is going to pass. But, Lord, we were created to bring you glory and to live with you forever. And so, Lord, may we just take heart from that. And, Lord, I just pray that each and every one here has placed their trust in Christ, their life in your hands, that, Lord, they too can look forward to that reunion with Ararat in glory. Now unto him that is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy, to the only wise God, our Savior, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. And the people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you all for attending, and we would like to invite everyone for the reception that's going to take place downstairs. God bless.